I really thank you for being here today. Uh, this is like on my bucket list. <laughs> this is on like believe it or not, this isn't this interview is on my career bucket list of things I wanted to do here. Um, I didn't again like we've we've spoken before. I, I I didn't have the privilege of you know being one of your your soldiers at in any point in my career because by the time I got here you were already at a brigade. At, I think you were at the brigade level already because I came in in 2012. 2012. Yeah, I was uh, I was at the battalion level. The battalion level. <coughs> so and I, and so I we we, we never crossed paths. True. Uh, but I heard so many wonderful things about no. Oh, Sergeant Major, Gora, and so on and so forth. And I don't know if you remember a few years back, I had uh, alongside Colonel Dolan had the show called Open Door. Yeah. And we did yeah. we did that interview in in, in San Santiago. Santiago. We put yeah, the chairs on the right. grass. I was a, I think I was a PFC back then or a specialist. Um, and man, I, it was it was a joy editing that video together. Like I didn't cut anything out because it was everything Com was conversando con conversando con yeah that's right so yeah so that was that I learned a lot about you which was the point of uh, the point of the conversation but me being an outsider at that point I was like I I got to sit yes. him down one day and I and talk with him um, personally so thank you thank you for being here yeah, thank this you. is this is an honor and a privilege for me and I hope everyone out there will you know see this and and be inspired who knows so we're going to shoot the intro real quick and then we'll begin our interview awesome welcome to informal this is where we sit down with the men and women of the puerto rico national guard learn their stories and see what makes them tick just to show the human side of the uniform today it is my honor and privilege to have with me a former state command sergeant major command sergeant major luis cora thank you for being here thank you thank you i uh, i'm honored uh to be interviewed right by one of our very <laughs> own uh our national guard our organization and you know what you represent in the national guard which is telling our story you know letting letting our citizens uh letting the people of the united states uh, know what we do, so I appreciate it. No, thank, thank, thank you, thank you for 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 taking time out of your schedule. I know we're we're you're in this wrap up uh, season right now because you you're retiring soon, right? Um, so thank you for taking the time and being here today with us. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about that, right? It was forty years, if I, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. So I, tell me a little bit about looking back at these forty years. Um, what are some of your, what are some memories that you have that you, you take with you? Excellent. Well, I think in the last 40 years, I, I, I break it down in, in decades. You know, what I did my first 10 years, my second 10 years, my third 10 years, and my last 10 years. So uh, I would say, you know, to answer your question, uh, I, I came in to the Guard looking for experience, uh, military experience, and long and behold, this career, this job, uh, this duty turned into something else, right? Turned into my full-time career. And that's not what I had intended to do. So I think, uh, you know, to answer your question, each decade had its own calling, if you will. But um, that first um, decade that I spent actually as a reservist, um, I, I really didn't take it serious. You know what I mean, I came in kind of a part-time soldier, mm -hmm. um, breaking away from what I was doing my civilian life. I was a salesman. I was selling cars back then. And, uh, you know, I got to hang up my suit and tie and hang out with my buddies, you know. Uh, back in New Hampshire when I uh, joined the uh, National Guard, we would always travel every year to Fort Drum. And traveling meant driving 24 hours from New Hampshire upstate. We'd sleep over in Burlington, Vermont and we would arrive in upstate New York, Watertown. And it was party time. <laughs> it was party time for me. It was getting out, doing uh, tactical things. You know, I was a field artillery. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I field artillery cannoneer, I, I felt that it was so different from the reason why I came in. I, I originally wanted to become a state trooper in our state. And, uh, and they weren't going to select a scrawny, no military experience guy like me. So that's one of the reasons, that was one of my motivators as to why I was in. But when I came in, 
uh, everything changed. Um, I realized that we were in the midst of the Cold War, um, and and it was, I mean, it was real. Yeah. It, it was a real war. It was just mental. It was uh, preparedness. We we call today readiness, but back then it was all about uh, preparedness. And um, I was single. I wasn't married. I was just living one day at a time. I was I was living the wild life. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know how it is in the States, right? <laughs> I do, I do. I mean, just no purpose in life, just wherever the world just go would take the wind me. Blows. Correct. That's <laughs> where I would end up and make the best of it. So um, my first decade, I spent um, uh, doing much of that. Um, so I, I think I take that away from that first decade, just building relationships with my friends, my buddies who uh, served, left the guard, and I continued here for you know, for 40 years. So when would you say was the time period where you went from not taking it so seriously to, okay, I'm going to go ahead and take it seriously? Okay. Yeah, I think that was my second decade. <laughs> yeah. When I, uh, I left the uh, New Hampshire Guard in 92, I arrived here in Puerto Rico in 93. And uh, back then they were, um, they were running through the elections, uh, just recently named a new governor. Uh, Honorable Pedro Rosselló, and uh, he sent the National Guard to all the housing projects, right? Oh, that was the Mano Dura mission. Right, the Mano Dura mission. And uh, I, uh, I put my business aside because I actually ended up in Puerto Rico because uh, this uh, entertainment company uh, from New Hampshire called Happy House Amusement had these slot machines, uh, fruit machines, poker machines. Yeah. And I, w I became a salesman for them, and that's how I ended up in Puerto Rico. But uh, long and behold, the government put a hold on all that sector, and uh, I became more involved with the guard. So I reported to Ato Rey I, uh, as an artillery uh, man, right? Uh, those, those were the artillery units that they had here in Puerto Rico. And then I became very active in Mano Dura, working 12-hour shifts, um, having fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was crazy and wild being in the streets of Puerto Rico with an armed M16 in my hand. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's been done since then. No, it hasn't. And, and I mean, it's like going into a war zone. But it wasn't a war zone. These are our own people. Yeah. You know? But that was the front. Uh, you know, that was our part, uh, being able to assist the, the local police. And by the way, I never mentioned, but... Originally, I joined the Guard because I wanted to become a state trooper, right? Yeah. And I wanted to really be an MP, you know, so I could have the experience. But all that went by the wayside. I ended <laughs> up with an M16 here in Puerto Rico. But that first uh, or that second decade and during the 90s, uh, early 2000s, I, uh, I was drill sergeant at the uh, Language Center, living it up. You know, and, and if they only knew that, that wasn't really me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. When I put on that, that brown round, when I put the drill sergeant hat on, it was lights, camera, action. action. You know, I was putting on a show, but I wasn't really, that wasn't <laughs> really me. But I grew into that, that monster. I grew into that, <laughs> that, that, that feared drill sergeant. You know, I just played the role. But if they only knew that deep down inside, I had nothing to do with that <laughs> role, you know what I mean? But uh, it was all about learning English, and that was the mission. And um, I knew that the only way that you could graduate from the Language Center was passing the language test. Everything else didn't really mean much. I mean, you, you, if you didn't know how to march, it didn't matter. If uh, you didn't understand uh, military commands, it didn't matter. What did matter was you passing that English test. And that's what I focused on. Um, but deep down inside, we're there trying to save as many soldiers as we could from a lot of things. You would think it would be just save them so that they could comply with their military career, reach their goals and dreams, right? But we also saved many from the life they lived outside the guard, outside the language center. Uh, I could recall many soldiers who didn't have a home, who were living with friends, uh, this is the only thing they have. Uh, others that quit school, uh, got a GED, and managed to pass the ASVAB. Uh, others that uh, were in college and single mom, couldn't afford the, uh, the bill anymore for their education, and joined the Guard. 
and others that came in with that mentality of the streets and that we had to clean them up, you know what I mean? Brush them up and make them look like a soldier. Would you say that your time in the language center kind of shifted your focus on taking care of the member? Of, you know, actually maybe started you on that path of my job is to take care of people. Yeah, actually, you know what started it at the language center, that, that shift that you're talking about, that, that human side, that, that, that factor, that inner me. When uh, back in 92, the Army introduced the Army values. And uh, no one really had a POI, program of instruction, to, uh, to kind of gear a drill sergeant to teach values. And uh, I took it upon myself to do a little research. And uh, I realized that the Army values were Jordanian Christian values, that it was more profound than what we had in the surface. And um, I decided to teach the Army Values at the Language Center. And believe it or not, I had to prepare myself to teach someone to inculcate values. How do you inculcate values to someone who already walks into your organization with their own set of values? How do you take a group of, of a platoon size of, of soldiers or, or civilians, right? Because they're in that transition, that transition right? Yeah. How do you group them all to think on one set of values? And I think that's where it clicked for me. I had to walk the talk. So now back in our previous episode, um, you said something about, it was like you were asked how your day started. Right. And you said your day started with prayer. Correct. But then you said something interesting well, you said some, you where you started doing this thing where you would divide, you used to divide your day on one hour slots, Correct. then thirty minute slots, and then you ended up in fifteen, 15 minute, minute slots. slots. Yeah. Did you did you continue with the fifteen minute slots? I, actually, I didn't. No, it was five minute slots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the pattern, but I I did not. The uh, you know going back to to what you said, and how I ended up in those that fifteen minute bracket, because it was just so much to do, right? I, um, I had a soldier, a private, that walked into my office one day. <clears throat> you know, I couldn't, for the face of me, tell you his last name. You know, we all go by last names. Yeah. There's no way I would remember your first name. <laughs> but with this private, I remember his first name, Rafael. I couldn't remember his <laughs> last name for the, I mean, days of me. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. He walked into my office one day with this bold authority. And I'm looking at him like, who are you to just barge in my office and have a seat in that chair without me saying, sit, sit down. down. You know what I mean? <laughs> Usually you stand in front of my desk and you stand at ease. This private came in, sit down, and I'm looking at him like, this better be good. <laughs> and he looked at me in the eyes and he said, I came to bring you a message from God. And I said, you came here to give me a message from God? He said, yes. He said, I came to tell you to look for a church and seek God. And I'm giving you this gift. Gave me a gift. It was a book called Purpose Driven Life, written by Rick Warren. 40 days, 40 chapters. And you kind of meditate after each day on, on that teaching. Yeah. That became my favorite book. I complied with the 40 days because I just felt the way he walked in that it was just something, right? <laughs> he it walked was in with something authority. Something about that, that private. That private never graduated. That private transferred to Florida. Never heard and seen again. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you for the face of me who he was, but I complied. Well, between that, the Army Value class, that's why my day starts with prayer. So, I read in your bio, and the, the phrase servant leadership. Yes. So is that where this comes in now, of being a servant leader? Yes, Speak absolutely. Speak a bit of it. Tell, tell, tell the folks out there, what is a servant leader? Okay. Well, I would say that um, I, I, I don't call it by chance. I, I call it by divine purpose, that I ended up serving in an organization that serves. Right? Usually you hear the expression, he joined the service, right? 
for he joined the military. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I joined the service, and this has been a teaching for me for the last 40 years of how to serve on all plateaus. So going back to servant leadership, servant leadership is when you take yourself out of the equation and the only focus on your mind is serving others. Um, you know, when, when you can serve someone and that person can't pay you back, that's true servant leadership. Um, the leadership comes by you being the role model. The servant leadership is the fact that others see in you that wholeness, that genuine uh, sense of serving without expecting anything in return. You know, I'm not doing it in, in we say in Spanish, uh, uh, for my own self glory mm -hmm. or, or for my own self pride. It's not about the pride. It's not for me, you know, going up the, the ladder. It, it's just genuine, I care about this person, I want to help this person uh, reach their objectives, their dreams, their goals. So that servant leadership, this organization helped me really tune in to really what service is all about. <clears throat> and uh, not just here in the organization, but at home. Uh, not just at home, but at the church. Which brings me to my next question. Um, where does it's all about the heart come from? Yes, awesome. Awesome. Es un asunto del corazón. It's all about the heart, right? The, um, I actually captured that during my first AT when I was the state command sergeant major. Uh, when I first came in, I was looking because every year <clears throat> as a CSM, I tried to find a motto that would kind of drive me for that year. And uh, when I first started as a state command sergeant major, my motto, I don't know if you remember the signature block on the bottom said, lead humbly. And uh, it was all about that. I wanted to remember, I wanted not to forget that I'm in this position, but I got to continue to stay humble. And uh, I, I didn't want the position to kind of override who Luis Cora is. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that became kind of my, my first year lead humbly. And, and it was a reminder for me. But my second year, I, uh, I was at the annual training, and um, during that annual training, you know, you at one point stand up in front of the, the AT uh, brigade that's, uh, that's, uh, the, that's in the middle of their, their AT period, and you would have to, uh, you know, give them your, your welcoming uh, remarks. And during those welcoming remarks, I had mentioned something because I saw a poster from Recruiting and Retention and on one of those slogans it said it's a decision of the heart or something something along that line. And, uh, and I said, you know what, everything we do here on AT is about the heart. You know, there's many people that are supposed to be here today, they're not here because their heart's not in it. So really this, this it's all about the heart. I realized that, hey, wait a minute. It's not just about the heart at work. It's about the heart at home. And it's about the heart at my church. And, you know, being a faith follower of Christ, God is the only one that really knows our true heart. So that really kind of put my thought together of coming up with, it's all about the heart, because no matter what you do during the course of the day, no matter where you're at during the course of the day, all the decisions that you make during the course of the day, you might think about it in your brain and in your mind, but really it goes down to the heart before you give the, the answer. You know, the, the word says, from the mouth speaks the heart. And, and uh, I'm a true believer of that. Mm -hmm. You can listen to a person speak, and really what's coming out of their mouth is really what they have in their hearts. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. <laughs> one, one final question, and this is more of a, let's just join me in this journey. If you could go back to 1983, and you have Luisito there standing in the buddy platoon, yep. maybe questioning, what, what am I doing here? What would you say to him? I would probably tell that young man, private, 
Cora. I don't know why you're joining the National Guard, but I can tell you that from here, you can go anywhere you want in the world. This is your point of origin. Where you choose to end up, you write. So here's a book, here's a pen, write down the chapters and make sure you put the final chapter of where you want to end up in this great career, the Army National Guard or serving your country in uniform. That's what I would tell that private. Had I known what I know now, <laughs> that's probably the way I would have looked at it. Well, thank you. Thank you, CSM right. for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And this is it for this month's Informal. We'll see you next month. Bye. Gracias.